Welcome back to the Sip and Feast podcast, episode number 32, The Power of Food Memories. So the question to get you warmed up here, think about this. You are wherever, it doesn't matter where you are, you take a bite of something, you are instantly transported back in time. It's the taste, but it's more so the smell. Right, Tara? I think it's a combination of both that has the ability to bring you back and it kind of triggers a memory of maybe it's the first time that you ate that food, but you can clearly see where you are, who is with you. Maybe it actually conjures up other smells because I find that sometimes happens. I can remember a smell, but it has to be activated by a, by a taste or another smell. It's very interesting how something just hits you like a ton of bricks. Mm -hmm. So for me, like, and we'll go, we're going to go over a bunch of them today, a bunch of uh, different ones that we have, uh, ones that like really always stand, they like stand the test of time with me. Anytime I'm making, say, zucchini, I'm brought back to, in a specific way, I'm brought back to my grandmother. It's just like that. It so transforms me. And then once you get transformed, then you actually start remembering what you looked like at the time, what you were doing. You can remember the sunlight yeah. shining in the room. It's so powerful. It truly I think. is. It it's, uh, has to do something with uh, the science of the brain and how we store these memories and how they kind of get locked away and then they, you know, they're in a vault, I guess, and then they don't come out of the vault until the smell like opens the vault. Yeah. It's yeah. it's a very, very odd thing. There is science behind it. And honestly, one could do an entire dissertation on the subject. So we're not going to get into too much of the science of it here. Although um, I do want to say, you know, Jim and I did read an article that I thought was really interesting. Um, it's It was from the BBC and it was called Why Food Memories Are So Powerful. In the article, the author who was from um, the former USSR, I forget exactly where she was from, but she talks about coming here. I think that her family settled in California. And then at one point she went back to, she went back to Russia and she ate some strawberries that were there. Meanwhile, she's had strawberries in the U.S., but she had not eaten these special types of strawberries or other berries that were specifically from that region where she was an, a toddler and an infant. And it triggered all of these different memories. And she shared that information with her mom and her mom explained, well, you used to eat these berries all the time when, when you were a toddler. And it's just, I guess that kind of prompted her to, to write this whole article which I think is really interesting and we'll definitely link here. But one of the things um, that she quotes in this article is from a professor of psychology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Her name is Susan Krauss Whitborn. And she said, food memories involve very, I'm gonna read this because it's, uh, it's a quote. Food memories involve very basic nonverbal areas of the brain that can bypass your conscious awareness. This is why you can have strong emotional reactions when you eat a food that arouses those deep unconscious memories. You can't put those memories into words, but you know there is something that the food triggers deep within your past. The memory goes beyond the food itself to the associations you have to that long ago memory, whether with a place or a person. Because food memories form without any conscious editing, they take on all the attributes of the situations in which they were acquired. They also can become associated with the activities involved in the act of cooking the food. The chocolate cupcake, a close family member taught you to make when they were young, became part of a larger experience with that person. Your recollection of family meals similarly take on additional emotional meaning that then become associated with those smells and tastes. There's a little bit of the science there, not too much, but it's a good explanation, I think, of 
of why we feel the way we do when we eat certain foods or smell certain things, right? The things that we smell doesn't just have to be food. It can be perfume, the smell of mown grass. Absolutely. In the, in the summer. Yeah, you can like smell sunshine. You can smell yeah. the ocean, the sand, um, the forest, like the breeze on the lake. Mm-hmm. I really uh, thought that was good, how, how you set that up there. I love your voice. You have an excellent podcasting voice. <laughs> you should maybe think about doing doing that one of these days. I'm available if anybody's interested. <laughs> <laughs> She's got a better voice than me. Um, it's the same mic, but her voice just comes through a lot better. I think you have a great voice. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I have my green tea right now to... Uh, you know, you're supposed to drink something warm mm-hmm. to help you. And, yeah. it, and it helps immensely. Yeah. All right. So now that we did the intro here, let's actually talk about specific memories for us. Yeah. And I have a feeling when we discuss these, maybe these stories, these memories will snap you back in time mm-hmm. or transport you back in time. That's the better way to say it. I like am already getting emotional because I know like, some of these memories that like the food brings up for me makes me feel nostalgic for my time as a kid. So I'm already getting like choked up at the anticipation of having to talk. I I can tell you are. And uh, that's, that's, I think that's very touching. Uh, I am not getting emotional yet, (laughs) but I do have a little twitch in my eye. So don't mistake that for getting emotional. I've had a twitch in my left eye since before Christmas. This is, we're recording this on New Year's day, but I feel like the lack of sleep and just feeling stressed leading up to the holidays, I just, my eyes just been twitching nonstop. My eyes actually improved during the holidays. I have bad eyes because I spend 10 hours plus a day looking at a computer screen, which is not good for anyone. We're society. We all have to do this now. It's it's nice to have one of the non-tech related jobs where you don't have to look at the screen. But anyway, I had a number of days off during uh, this this time this this holiday period and it, my eyes were able to improve. That's good. That's that's it in a nutshell. Like I went to an eye doctor. He's the uh, person's like, got to stop looking at the screen so much. Well, I'm like, well, how do I? I, I really can't do that. Yeah, it's really hard. I got reading glasses from him. I digress. Let's, let's go into the memories. Okay. First memory for me. These aren't in any particular order. I have like fifty of these, but these were ones that really stand the test of time. So there is this barbecue sauce. This barbecue sauce, the name of the barbecue sauce is Open Pit. Many of you will know Open Pit right away when I say that. Many of you won't. Tara, did you know, do you know what Open Pit is before I told you about it? No. No. I probably had it. I just didn't know what it was. So Open Pit has this distinctive taste, tangy, vinegary taste uh, I think the bottle says it's a Kansas City barbecue sauce, I think, but I might be wrong. Anyway, it's a barbecue sauce that is a popular barbecue sauce in delis. Long Island delis, New York delis, I would assume delis in Westchester as well. It's probably because it's on the trucks of the food distributors like DeCaro and st- places like that. Re- Restaurant Depot probably stocks it. Any deli I've ever been to, it's open pit. But when I was... A kid, right down the street from me, I was blessed to have a deli. So the deli's name was Ziggy's Deli, and it also then switched to uh, uh, Bridge Street Deli, because Bridge Street is the intersection, the intersected street where I grew up on. And same owners, I think, and everything. And it was just like kind of in almost like a residential development, because all I would have to do is ride my bike down down to the end of the street, make a right, hit a cul-de-sac, jump through there, and then I hit like kind of like a main area. There was like a 7-Eleven and a whole bunch of stores and everything. But this deli, which is now a Dunkin' Donuts, was there. And me and my friends, you know, from when we were young, we would always ride our bikes there and we would pick up heroes. And the two heroes that we would have the most were the Texas-style chicken and the hot cheesy beef. So the Texas style chicken is the one with the barbecue sauce. It's a chicken cutlet, like a good breaded chicken cutlet, pounded flat, nice big cutlet. Uh, the good hero rolls that are available everywhere in, in the New York area, you know, the bread. 
and then mozzarella cheese and this barbecue sauce. Really, really simple, but just the combination of these was just amazing. I have a friend, uh, James, and you know, he still st I still talk to him. He messages me, and he's like, "When are you going to make a video for uh, the Texas style chicken?" <laughs> so it's like it's been in our consciousness forever. But anytime I have that barbecue sauce, it sends me back in time to riding a bike when I was 11 years old with with my brother who was nine and you know my friends and getting that Texas style chicken. Uh, the reason the memory got unlocked the other day is because we got heroes from this place called Seaport Deli. Seaport Deli is the most famous deli in all of Long Island or one of the most famous. Guy Fieri went there for diners, drives and dives. It's right where we live now. It's a wonderful deli. It's been there for like about 70 years, I believe. They got pictures dating back to the 50s or 60s. And I got a sandwich from them. Amazing sandwich. They have some of the best heroes of any place. And right when I bit that sandwich, because it had barbecue sauce mm -hmm. on it, I was transported back in time. I love that. You know who I think would like that sandwich? Who? Sam. Sam, yeah. She loves barbecue sauce on everything. It's such a simple sandwich because the sandwiches at Seaport Deli are anything but simple. So this is the this is the recent hero that I got. Mm -hmm. Like the Seaport Deli one had like all the stuff that I had on the Texas style chicken. Then it had like sweet potato fries and like German potato salad <laughs> and just I mean these heroes are they're they're so big and they're such a good value. Like when you take a bag from there, like four heroes, yeah. you need like you need help to hold that bag to get out of there. If you go there, you might look and be like, "Why am I going to spend sixteen dollars for a hero?" Trust me, when you get the hero or the sandwich or whatever it is that you get, you get it like three meals out of it. Yeah, so it's you're not really spending sixteen dollars. Yeah, I love this place, and they have um, they like have like famous. I think players baseball players right and who've gone there and so the sandwich is named after them they have like local politicians and well, stuff. they had a local firefighter firefighter yeah yeah i don't know i don't think they named anything who after was a the, politician who was the firefighter was that the jacob de Grom? no it's something was that a baseball that's jason, a baseball player jason matt or something jason like that Matz. but yeah a lot of the sandwiches are named after yeah. local people which is pretty cool yeah so that's my memory what's yours okay so one of my triggering memories is my my grandmother's salad dressing. So when I say my grandmother, I mean my dad's mom. She passed away when I was in second grade, so I was really little. Um, but her salad dressing, while I don't still not 100% sure everything that was in it, every time I taste something, like I, I think I've kind of nailed her salad dressing. <laughs> I've tried so many different times. Whenever I taste something that tastes like her salad dressing, it transports me back to her kitchen. And I can remember how she smelled. I can remember how her bra strap would always like fall down her her shoulder. Like I'm just transported to that. And I'm actually like transported in such a way that when I'm envisioning myself there, I'm seeing myself through like a child's eyes. Mm. Like I'm imagining yeah. the room around me, but not through an adult's eyes, but yeah. through a child's eyes, which is so strange and interesting. It's yeah, it's like out it's of body incredible. experience. It really is. It's like when you die, and you're, when you're in the operating table and you're looking down at the doctors operating mm -hmm. on you. Yeah, and actually, I think this was one of the recipes that I would really like to include in the cookbook. Again, she never wrote a recipe down or anything, but I've worked through the years to try and nail her, the taste of her salad dressing. Well, we've spoken about this in the past. I believe it was probably similar to the way, um, say like Lusso's in Smithtown makes their dressing. Mm -hmm. do you, do you, does it taste similar to that? Um, sort of. Because Lusso, I'm, I think they're using vegetable oil. Not yeah. olive oil, definitely, yeah. and white vinegar. Mm -hmm. uh, really simple. Uh, I think those onions are blanched that go in the salad. Yeah, she was definitely not using extra virgin olive oil. I think she was using maybe a mixture of olive oil and then maybe some other type of oil to neutralize it or 
not to neutralize it, but just to save Vegetable money. Vegetable oil didn't have a stigma back then. Yeah. Vegetable oil was the predominant oil yeah. that was used. And even if you look at old it's Italian true. cookbooks that were written for America in the you know 50s, 60s, 70s, it's all it's vegetable oil, everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or Crisco. Well, what I would like to do is, and it's something that I've been doing the past couple of times I've made salad dressing, I've been cutting the extra virgin with avocado oil. Mm. That's a neutral oil. To neutralize it yeah. a little bit. And I think that I, I like it better that way, actually, which is yeah. kind of weird. The olive oil, like, I mean, the vegetable oil stigma is a, is a new thing for sure. We know that from a lot of the comments we get. Uh, yeah. People- Younger younger cooks, people who are starting to learn for the first time. I, when I say younger cook, I mean someone who's like five years of cooking. Uh, everything they're learning now, everything they're being told is from a, is a new generation of mm -hmm. instruction. So if they they're not exposed to any of that old cooking styles or cookbooks, it's will will be very foreign to mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to the next one. All right. What's your next memory, Jim? Shrimp Fra Diablo. So I did a video for this one when I started the channel. It, we're going to do another one. Uh, if you want to really laugh, I recommend you watch the video. I have the ponytail, uh, massive hair in that video, and just um, <laughs> I either look ridiculous or awesome, depending on- You look like Keanu Reeves, like- brother who's maybe like a little shorter and you're like you're looking like shorter and fatter bizarro keanu reeves yeah <laughs> thanks tara you're welcome <laughs> um yeah no i had the hair the hair was long but anyway that video uh forget about the hair it's not it, it's when i first started making videos so the audio and the video quality aren't up to snuff i would say so anyway the, getting back to the memory here Shrimp Fra Diablo, I have a very intimate relationship with. So when I was young, we didn't go to many restaurants at, when I was a kid. And I think that my experience was probably, was was quite similar to many of the people that are listening to this, Tara, who are, who are around our age. Probably. There were less restaurants back then mm -hmm. than there are now. Yeah, definitely. From at what least, I remember, At anyway. least in Long Island. I mean, we grew up in Long Island. Um, on Long Island, in Long Island, whichever you want to say. Yeah. Um, we weren't, we didn't grow up in the city where there were obviously more But even if you grew up in the city, you would have had to been a wealthy family to yeah, experience that. Yeah, go to that. Like, Tavern on the Green, things yeah, like that. I, yeah, no, I mean, where I grew up, I grew up in Farmingdale. We rarely went to a restaurant. Yeah. In fact, my parents rarely went to restaurants. And if they did, it was usually for their anniversary and they would either go to um, a Chinese restaurant, which was in Farmingdale, called the Lotus Garden, or they would go to Francesco's or Bella Napoli. I think Francesco's was in Farmingdale, maybe Beth Page. It was like right, right, right there on the border, and Bella Napoli was on Route 109 in yeah. Farmingdale. I don't think it's there anymore. I don't even remember the place that I had it, but my story essentially is that was the first dish. When I was 10 or maybe eight, I would say like eight, maybe maybe a little bit younger, that was the dish that I always wanted to order mm -hmm. as a kid. And, you know, my, my parents let us, let me and my brother order from the big, you know, the, the adult menu. And that was the one. And I always, now, even to this day, every time I have shrimp fra diablo, whether I make it or I don't really order it at restaurants, it just zooms me back to when I was a kid mm -hmm. ordering it. And like my dad would be like, is that spicy enough for you? Uh, do you want more spice in there? Because it was like, it was like, oh, you, you know, you're young. You're going to try the spicy dish, mm -hmm. which, you know, admittedly, there's no, there's really no spicy Italian food. Yeah. Italian food is not spicy. Even the most spicy food, the uh, Calabrian stuff is tame compared to other other cuisines like Thai and Indian. And uh, I'm not telling you probably anything you don't know, but back then I think my family's tolerance anyway for spice was a lot less. To this day, my mom thinks too many chili flakes are are, are too spicy. Sometimes black pepper is a little too spicy yeah. for her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I was like adventurous. They thought I was adventurous having the shrimp fra diablo, but anytime I have it now, I am... Uh, I'm transported back immediately being that little kid wanting to order from the big person's menu. Nice. I like that one. What do you have? 
So I have, and this is more of, I guess, a smell than a taste. This is yeast. So anytime I smell yeast, like when I'm about to make, like I make the those dinner rolls that I use yeast for, um, whenever I have a smell that yeast kind of like mixed with the flour and the water or whatever liquid it is that I'm using, it transports me back to this one day in particular when I was little. I really think I must have been three because I don't think my sister was born yet. My sister, uh, my sister and I are four years apart. So there was this one day where my mom, she would occasionally make this oatmeal bread and she had to use yeast for it. And I remember her like prepping the dough and then putting it in front of the window with a towel over it. And then I remember like she, we, we left out the back door and we walked around and went through the gate and then we walked to this park that was around the block from my house. And it was like a beautiful summer day, but I can really remember like the sun hitting the side, like the side gate of our house as we were leaving. And I remember like thinking, oh, when we come back, we're gonna get to have this bread. Yeah. Because she did, ex like my mom was very good at explaining things to me when I was that age. You know, she would say, Tara, we're gonna do this because of this. And you were a good listener. Yeah, no, I, I think I was a good listener. I think. I always have been. I enjoy listening to people more than I enjoy talking, um, which makes me kind of a good match for you. That's right. But anyway, I, I love that smell of yeast. Um, it just, it I transports love that smell. me. I love that smell too. Yeah, and you know, my dad shared with me that he also loves that smell. I think it's a great, you know, I think it's a primal smell. So it is. I know like yeast has been created for, all of modern homo, homo sapiens time, mm -hmm. whether by accident originally, and then eventually used properly to make bread and to ferment. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the first type of alcohol? Honey, right? Well, honestly, I don't, meat, so meat is fermented honey, but I think the Egyptians invented beer. They invented beer. And I think Beer might be older than mead, yeah. but I don't know. I'm not a food historian, although yeah. I, I wish I was, because I think that would be an awesome type of thing to study, but I don't know. So I'm just kind of- Yeah, but the but the process of using yeast, harnessing yeast yeah. is a primal it thing. It is. It's the same as like smelling, it's the same as like smelling meat cooking over a fire. Oh like yeah. Like that's primal. It taps into that something. primal part of the brain. Let me ask you something about that. A little bit of tangent here. So we have a we have a good amount of vegan and vegetarian listeners. Yeah. So what do you think about that? You say the meat is a primal smell. Now for vegan and vegetarians, is that something that does that affect them, that primal smell or not? Or do you think it's like their rational brains override that primal Urge. So I can only speak for myself. So I spent a great deal of time during my younger years as a vegetarian, right? Um, in fact, I have another memory that kind of ties into this in a little bit. But um, we became vegetarians when I was eight years old. My mom read Fit for Life by Harvey and Marilyn Diamond. And we, she decided that our family would would no longer consume meat. Um, so from the time I was eight until probably the time I was in high school and started sneaking <laughs> chicken sandwiches or chicken nuggets from the school cafeteria, um, I can say that for me, I constantly craved meat. If I would go to a friend's barbecue or family's barbecue and I would smell it. It smelled amazing. I would see commercials on TV for like cold cuts and I would just want to jump through the screen and eat the meat. Now, this I don't- This video is not sponsored <laughs> by the Meat not, Council. It's not. I I don't know like if, if there's any truth, scientific truth to this, but I, I've heard that there are certain um, diets for your blood type. And I am type O. Type O's apparently are the original blood type of humans, and they need a more um, 
like more like a paleo diet where there's a lot of meat, there's berries, seeds, things like that. Um, so I don't know if it's because of my blood type I or think, if it's because yeah. just I... Is that really based on science though? I, think I don't know. That sounds like a bunch of gobbledygook. I've, you know? I've, heard, I've heard that. And I think type AB is like the newest blood type and they're better suited with a vegetarian we more, diet. We need more O-neg over here. Yeah. <laughs> so... That's the universal blood that you uh, have in hospital for anybody. So I, I'm only answering for myself as a former vegetarian that I constantly craved it. Now, I think it would be interesting to hear from some of our vegan or vegetarian listeners if you do have those cravings and what you do to kind of- I am I am interested in that. So yeah, if, if that is your, uh, your lifestyle, and I- Again, the reason I mentioned it, because I know there are a good amount that are, please leave a comment, let us know. And also for all of you, please like and share this and subscribe, not just here on YouTube, if you're watching this, if you are watching this, subscribe on Apple or Spotify, whichever is your preferred podcast listening source, you'll get notified there. We release them the exact same time. So Basically, it matters if you're, you know, if you're in a car, you'll probably want to listen uh, versus if you're home, maybe you're watching. But that really helps us out. If you give ratings to this on Apple or Spotify, that also helps us out. Mm -hmm. This is something that Tara, well, I can only speak for myself. This is something that I really love doing. And right now it's, we're in episode number 32 today. So it's 32 weeks. I kind of enjoy doing this more so than making the cooking videos. That doesn't mean we're we're we're, con we're, we're continuing on the cooking videos. Do not worry about that. But I, I don't know. I, I really like doing this. Do you, what do you think, Tara? I think it's certainly. I think it's easier than making a cooking video. There's less that can go kind of wrong. Go wrong. I guess. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when we're doing this, it's just. It really is like we're having a conversation. Like, yeah. I mean, maybe like you're a little bit of a nicer. <laughs> version of yourself. No, I'm kidding. But no, when when we're in this podcast room recording our podcast, we're having a real conversation. So many times we'll be in our office and we'll have conversations like this. And then we're like, oh, that should have been a podcast. Yeah. Because this is how we are in real life. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm actually a little bit more sarcastic off camera because I can there were a number of, <laughs> I try to be on good behavior. There were a number of comments for today's episode, which was episode number 31, which was uh the I, food the yeah, food for the I 2024. Saw, I saw someone they were they mentioned they were like I don't I don't want to come here to watch you two argue. Yeah. Which I I agree. I mean again, we're we're not episode we're not in episode 320 here. We haven't been doing it for 7 years. So we are kind of feeling this out. I I will tr try to I'm trying to be honest here. Is this is our normal kind of conversation. There probably, as, as Tara said, though, there's a little bit more sarcasm involved. Yeah, in real life. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I digress. Please leave the reviews, the ratings, a five-star rating, not a, not a one-star rating. Okay, enough of that. Let's go on to the next memory. All right. Tell me what is my next memory, Tara? A fried zucchini you put Ooh, on your list? Fried zucchini. Okay. So- this one transports me quicker than anything. So when I am frying zucchini and I fry zucchini during the summer, when I grow them or you know buy them from the store, they're abundant, they're everywhere. Whenever I fry the discs in the olive oil, I for making whether it's spaghetti nerano or just just a simple fried zucchini, it's just delicious in olive oil by itself. Once they come out, a little salt on there, mm -hmm. I am transported immediately back to the basement kitchen my grandmother had and because she'd always be down there like frying zucchini almost all the time. I mean, I know that wasn't the only thing she made, but if when I was a kid, it kind of felt that way to me. And mm -hmm. what she would do is she would fry them, maybe a little salt, but often just a dusting of uh, pecorino or uh, you know Parmesan cheese on, on there. And then she would use them to make pasta, but of, often she would just take them and then mix them in some eggs for like a zucchini egg omelet, mm, like so scrambled good. eggs with zucchini or maybe a frittata or something like that. But I, when I have zucchini, I am, I'm transported back. Yeah. That Any type so of good. frying too. It's, I could even be like when I'm doing the sticks and breading them. Yeah. Can you make that for dinner tonight? 
I'm you want serious. that, right? Yeah. Like, I want fried zucchini. Yeah. Well, it sounds so good. Are you talking about just the fried zucchini or spaghetti Nerano? No, like spaghetti Nerano. Spaghetti Nerano. Yeah. Yeah. If you haven't had spaghetti Nerano, make it. What are you waiting for? It's a simple dish. You will love it. But your grandma didn't call it that. She no. just called it, what did she call it? She fried just called it fried zucchini, zucchini pasta. Fried right? zucchini uh, spaghetti. Spaghetti, yeah. Because she didn't know the, she didn't know the names of this. You know, you got to think about like these people. They come here and they don't have the names of it, but they just- They just know how to make it. They just, yeah, they're, they know how to make it because it's what their mother made all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that's it. So my next memory um, involves a lemon Italian ice. And I'm going to share something, a little fun fact. So one of my favorite authors is Mike Viking or Viking. He's Danish. So I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. But I listened to a bunch of his books. He runs the Happiness Research Institute, which is based in Copenhagen. And he talks a lot about the Scandinavian concept of Hygge, H-Y-G-G-E. Again, not the best pronunciation. He did put out a book a couple of years ago called The Art of Making Memories. Prior to that book, in order for him to conduct some of his research, he did a worldwide study that he opened to all of his followers. And I actually participated in the survey. And one of the questions was, um, to recall one of your earliest childhood memories and to describe it. So I described mine and it actually wound up in his book. Yeah, I'll put it right here so people yeah. can see it right in front of my head. Is that in focus? <laughs> right? It, it always tries to grab my eyes. That's okay. why, so that's why I had to cover my face. Yeah, so it made its way into his book. Walk, and this was a quote from my memory. Walking down the main street in the town I grew up, and with my mom while eating a lemon Italian ice. So I say that because when I have a lemon Italian ice, and it, it, I'm not talking like a Marino's Italian ice from the grocery store. I'm talking about an Italian ice from a pizzeria. Yeah, with the white cup. In a white Dixie yeah. cup. Okay, those are the. That's what I'm talking about. I am transported back to Farmingdale, circa 19. 81 maybe, I don't know, I was born in 1978. So maybe it was that time, I was really little. My mom would take me to Gino's Pizza and I would always ask for an ice. I would get an, a lemon Italian ice and there used to be, I think it's still there, like a little village green in Farmingdale and they used to have a fountain. I don't know if the fountain is still there, but I remember the fountain being on, I remember the smell of the water from the fountain. And I remember it just being a warm, beautiful summer day. So when I taste the lemon Italian ice, that's what I'm like immediately brought back to. Yeah, I mean, ice, I, I think the ices have, that's one that you can easily transport yourself back because a lot of those memories are during the summer. So yeah. like whether it was like the truck that would come around yes. that would have them um, or the p local pizzeria or or whatever they would have them. I mean, I remember like like the old days they didn't have a lot of flavors. They had uh Yeah. I think the place I think it was like pineapple, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. The chocolate chip. Van you mean vanilla? Vanilla chip. With the chocolate vanilla chip, chip yeah. Mm -hmm. Lemon obviously. Mhm. Mm chocolate. Chocolate. Cherry. Cherry, and that was like kind of rainbow. It. Rainbow, rainbow, yeah. Yeah, those were the main yep. flavors. I think that's another thing we're going to include in the cookbook. Yeah, well, how to make them? Yeah, they're, I think they're fairly simple to do. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be. I think it'll be nice, and that's what the cookbook will be. We're kind of in this limbo state now. We, we I wish I could snap my fingers and have it out, but that's not. We don't want to put out. We want to put out the best product possible, so it will be. It will take a while to do. Yeah, definitely. All right, Jim, next on your list is the pool bag bar burger. Yeah, so pool bag, um, I don't know. If you're listening, if you worked in the city, uh, what was it, like in the 30s, Murray Hill area, I, I would so. say? Yeah. yeah. We went there for, for a few years until it was gone. I think the whole block was bought by a developer mm -hmm. and- like a high rise was put up over there and which is, you know, the history of the city. It's just always doing that. But this place had 
the smell of this place when I would go in there, and I used to go there with uh, people I worked with first. That's how like, I found out of the bar. We, we would get drinks and play pool. But the burger they had was just, in my opinion, it was the best burger in the city. At that period of time, everybody was saying Patrick Cavanaugh's had the best burger mm -hmm. in the city. Yeah. Now there's some other places. And I'm like a time capsule of like how the city was like in the <laughs> 2000s, like the early 2000s. Um, I'm, I'm sure Patrick Cavanaugh is still there though. But this place, Pool Bag, the burger was just so juicy and the best ever. And so now anytime we're at an Irish bar, I always compare it mm -hmm. against that burger. Mm -hmm. So I guess the memory essentially is when I'm in that, like the Irish bars that we go to now mm -hmm. and I smell the bar, you know, the beer on the floor and, you know, the little bit of, um, yeah, like stale, musty flavor, <laughs> uh, flavor smell. It's a good musty smell. Musty smell, a yeah. bar. And yeah. but I will, once I like smell a burger coming by, it will always transport me back there. Mm -hmm. What about you? What did you think of that burger? I loved that burger. It was so good. I, I think. Simple burger. It was simple. Yeah. And I think more than the burger, it was just like that feeling that like we would meet there. I think it was every Thursday we yeah. would go there and we would play golden tea. You oh yeah, that? golden tea, and another would, time capsule. Yeah, and yeah. we would play pool. And the beer that we had when we were there was Sam Adams. Sam Adams. Like yeah. I never, I don't remember getting Sam Adams anywhere else other than that place. But that was like the beer that we would drink when we when we would go there. I always remember there was two guys. Do you remember those guys who were always in there playing pool? They would bring their pool sticks. Yeah. Oh like, my god, I forgot about that? that. Yeah. That guy, yeah, that they guy were, was serious. They were just like, these guys were business, all business. I mean, they they worked, you know, they yeah. would come after work, but I forgot about they that. had their sticks and, you know, he would like take it out of the pouch, unscrew it together and uh, yeah, yeah, play against him. I used to love beating him when You're, I beat him. You didn't beat him. I was good. I, I still am good, you know, but no, I, <laughs> I beat him occasionally. I mean, most of the time he beat me, but no, when mm -hmm. I would, when I would get him, I mean, listen, you know, clock strikes 12 twice a day, you know? Yeah, true. All right. So my... That doesn't make, I don't like how you, you threw me under the bus there. I'm I actually didn't... a good pool player, you know? We had a pool table in our in our old house that the previous owner left there for us. Oh, Remember God. that? Yeah, yeah but I, I mean, they left it didn't... for us. They, this, was, this is our, like, two houses ago. We had this pool table and... We knew the previous owner, so we took it off them. Yeah. But it was not, it didn't fit in the room. It was in the living room. So like you couldn't, it was like the Seinfeld episode where you would, you know, you'd be like trying to, you have to use like the mini <laughs> stick every time or like go through the window. Yeah. No, but we, it was in our living room. And when we moved into the house, it was like right before Sammy was born. So we were using the pool table to, as like a changing, changing table. table. That's what it was. And then we eventually, we had to pay oh, yeah. a company to come and take the pool table apart and move it into the basement because there's, it's made with slate or slate. something, like a few different pieces of slate. That, the table weighs so, like 600 pounds. Yeah, so yeah. it needed to be professionally disassembled and then reassembled. And re-leveled. Yeah. I mean, I could have done it all, but I, I would have needed a, a hand. I would definitely need another person because the top is, it's in multiple pieces, the mm -hmm. top. Yeah. So it has to be shimmed. So it's, because you can't have it where it's like, where there's bumps yeah, in it or anything. Yeah. And then it like needs to be refelted and mm -hmm. just, you know. Yeah. That was a, uh, that was an interesting yeah. time. But yeah, Sammy, <laughs> Sammy had a pool table or changing table. Um, okay. So my next memory, Jim, is was actually triggered recently. I don't even know if you remember this, but you had made Hungarian goulash. Mm. Okay. And I took a bite of it and I was like, oh my God, I've, I've had this before. So, and it brought me back and I'm like, I remember having my mom make this. So again, this must've been definitely before I was eight because that was when we became vegetarian, but it brought me back to that period of time. I haven't tasted anything like it since then. And I did ask my mom, I was like, did you make beef stew with like peppers in it? And because it, it, the, the goulash is unlike really any other type of beef stew that I've had in recent years. Yeah, and it's not supposed to be stew. I know you it's know not. Many, I know it's not. How many stew. people let us know? It's I know it's more like soup. a soup. So my mom did say that her grandmother, who was 
my mom was raised by her grandmother, that she used to use peppers and onions in her beef stew. So that, I guess, must have been how my mom made it. But that's what it tasted like. It tasted like that goulash. Now, I don't know if peppers. there was paprika in it, too. My my the great, peppers itself, when you cook yeah. it, will, will have that taste. My great-grandmother was Czech. Yeah. So I don't know if it was... I don't know if they use a lot of paprika in the Czech Republic. Yeah, I, I, don't I, I, I don't know. But it, your goulash tasted like that beef stew. Hmm. And it... I, I, I like I hadn't tasted it in many, many years. Yeah, it's so nice when when that happens to you and you're like, I've had this before. Mm -hmm. Yep. I got one more that is a real quick one, but it definitely like unlocks that's the smell now. So it's the smell of essentially making a good marinara sauce. So I was on I cooked in from when I was young and I was pretty proficient, but I never was able to quite get my food to taste like that typical uh, Italian restaurant in New York circa 1980 or 1995. Basically, heavy on garlic, red sauce fare food, basically Rayo's. You know, that's what Rayo's is. Rayo's is like the, you know, the most exclusive in one, but all the places are the same, whether it's Carmine's um, and like La Palma out here in Long Island or Tony DiNapoli in the city, they're all, they're all the same. The food is simple. And I wanted this sauce to be, have that super garlic flavor. So I was kept, kept on experimenting with it. And at this time I was living in the city, I was 21 or 22, like right out of college. I, um, started doing well with my job. So I was able to rent and I was on a six floor walk up on the Upper East Side and I would make food there, test out food while my roommate was eating can of soup every night or uh, and Tosti tortillas. Tostitos. He was like, this guy, <laughs> the, the amount of contempt he had for me when I was cooking there, it was like, he would just look at me. He had he had his soup in his plastic Tupperware well, thing. Well, he could have eaten your food. I offered. I did yeah. offer. But he would just, like, what are you doing, Jim? What are you doing? And eating the Tostitos. But anyway, I was working on my sauce during that period of time. <laughs> and I finally nailed it. Like, I put in like 15 cloves of garlic Whole think, cloves. Whole cloves. I think we went to La Palma be right before this. So yeah. I was like noticing what they did. And the trick is the garlic, when it, it can't just, you see so much stuff like, and these are like good chefs. They're like, like, and I'm talking like really good chefs. They're like, don't let the garlic get any color. Don't burn the garlic. Don't do it. Listen, if you know, you know what I'm talking about. That's not how you do food. With red sauce, okay? You got to actually put a lot of color on the garlic. And, like, they'll put it on. They'll make it to the point where it's almost, like, darkish brown. But in the oil, and I was putting, like, six, seven tablespoons of olive oil in there. And the garlic, when it hit it, and I would do the cloves on both sides, they were getting, like, super golden mm -hmm. toasty. Then when you put the tomatoes in and they hit, and when those tomatoes hit the oil, and I was just, like, because up until that point, I was, like, listening to those really supposedly good chefs with three stars next to their name. But once the garlic hit there and the sauce hit the garlic, it was, it was an epiphany, mm -hmm. the best sauce ever. And then, you know, you had it right after I did it. Well, it tasted, and, it tasted like La Parma. It's yeah. like you finally figured out how La Parma made their, I don't want to say marinara because they use it in everything. They, they use it, it in their clam sauce. Yeah, they use everything. it in their arrabbiata. Yeah. It's it's always those whole you know what garlic they do? cloves that are like almost burnt. And you know what they not. do? How they do it? I noticed this. I was looking in the deep back. Deep fryer? I was not a deep fryer, but I was looking in the back of, uh, I forget which place it was. They had a bowl the size of, it was this big. It was filled yeah. with the garlic. So it wasn't confit, but it was, it was uh, the garlic was already done in the oil. In the so oil. what they do then to start, start, they just take a it ladle, just, they oh. throw it all in the pan. So then whether they're doing clam sauce or tomatoes or whatever, mm. that's how they do that's it. That's a good so idea. It's a great idea. Yeah. So that's how, that's how these restaurants, most of them, I assume are doing yeah. it. And uh, it, it just unlocked it for me. So now that memory, every time I have that smell, when I get my garlic to that stage, I am transported back 
to Manhattan, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 2000, what, one? Yeah, right around there. Yeah. And yeah. that's it. That's when I, re that's like really when the epiphany happened. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, like in college, I was making like, I was doing well. I was making good stuff for, for, for my friends, which was, which is weird, you know, um, like it was like three in the morning. Um, but I didn't have the sauce nailed yet. Yeah. I think no. I nailed it right then, right? Yeah. Yep. In that I remember old pre-war building, when the power would go out, it had fuses in the bottom. <laughs> it and the fuse box was located at the bottom of this restaurant called Cafe Bon Gusto. Yep. You lived. And <laughs> I would have to knock on the door for the restaurant. I'd be like, "My power's out. I'm on the sixth floor." And I would go in there, and um, I I had the I couldn't I didn't have fuses at first, so I would buy them. So then I bought a bunch of them because it happened a few times. It did. Yeah. It was an interesting time. The Jim, so one of the things talking about like memories and food, these two things that I'm going to name that we have recipes for on our site, we get so many comments from people that like they made this and it brought them back to their aunt's kitchen or their grandma's kitchen or these recipes seem to unlock most of the memories for our followers, viewers, you know, what, however you want to call yourself. The first one is your chicken and potatoes mm. dish. So I don't know what it is about it. There's a lot of oregano. There's garlic. There's something magical about that dish. I think it's outrageously delicious, but so many people say that, that someone that they love who's no longer here used to make that and it transports them. The other, the other recipes, and I'm going to say it's three of them really, or the deli salads, the potato salad, the macaroni salad, and the coleslaw. Those three deli style salads have unlocked so many memories for folks. And they've, you know, they they're always commenting. They're like, I can't believe yeah. this is it. This is the one. It transported so, me. So they're both Tara is spot on here. And I would say, I'll go out on a limb, if we can nail the heroes hero bread and the rolls mm. then that one would probably be that would put us in like hall of fame status it those would, are it would, those are going to be hard those are hard to nail yeah you well, have to go to modern bakery and I, ask them for the recipe no it's it's the way they're baking them too in the oven i would have to like get our oven set up to do it so it would be a lot of testing and you know, the, the unfortunate reality is like, I can't spend that much time on one thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could, and I feel like, I feel like we should get that. Um, once you nail the hero, you'll have the, uh, it's, it's like, you know, it's called a Kaiser, but it's not a Kaiser. It's not, it's yeah. a soft round roll with, with poppy seeds. Yeah. It's not a Kaiser. Yeah. Like you can't substitute one for the other. Yeah. You That's know, right. You just can't. So anyway, but yeah, as far as the chicken and potatoes, that one is, I think like everybody's grandmother made that dish mm -hmm. and they all have like a little bit of variation. Some would use more garlic or more onion. I actually put onion and garlic in ours. I put a lot of cheese in it too. But the real trick, like the game changer for that recipe is the oil. You got to like make the chicken swim in oil. Mm -hmm. Like People will often say, they'll be like, are you sure this is recipe is correct? I'm like, yeah, it is. You need a lot of oil for it. Mm -hmm. A lot of oil. And pro probably back then, grandmas and nonas weren't even using olive oil. They were probably using vegetable oil for mm -hmm. it. But uh, I use olive oil. And then as far as the, the salads, the trick there, and I didn't make it 100% replica of the delis. The one thing that I was missing was the decorator mayo. So the decorator mayo is a thicker version of Hellman's and or whatever the Restaurant Depot brand is. It's like the imitation Hellman's. But it's a thicker mayo because I'll I'll notice like when I make it. So this is if you're if you're into these salads and you want to make them perfect, you can buy that mayo from Amazon or if you do have a restaurant supply store, you can get it from them. And the difference is it makes the salads like look like thicker, like whiter versus mm -hmm. when I did it, it was a little bit more transparent, but I actually heard you could just turn regular mayo into decorator mayo by uh, whisking it. 
like power whisking. Oh, like it. adding air to it. Yeah, it'll just get thicker. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Try try that if if you're if yeah. you're dead set on it. That's yeah. cool. All right, so that's what we had for today. There's plenty more memories I have. I'm sure you have a bunch of memories too. If you have a really good one, leave it in the comments. Remember, send us your questions. We didn't do any questions today because this one was a little bit uh, longer mm -hmm. than than normal. But still, we love your questions. Send them to podcast at sipandfeast.com. As I said in the middle, I'm going to say it again. Rate this podcast, subscribe, follow it on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and like it and share it and tell your friends and your neighbors and anybody else who will listen to you. Right, Tara? Yes. Thank you. We'll see you next time.